Hello and welcome back if you followed the show this morning and welcome if you were new to joining us this afternoon. Um, this morning we heard directly from the teams who've been involved in implementing new remote monitoring technologies on the ground and it was great to see so much sharing and interaction with the audience. So please do keep that coming. It's great to see so many connections being made and that's what the Innovation Collaborative is all about. This afternoon we'll be hearing some, from some national and local leaders to hear their perspectives on the opportunities and plans to further scale up remote monitoring, as well as the final session, which will be focusing on the Innovation Collaborative Programme for this year and plans for next. So our first session to kick start the afternoon, we will be hearing from Matthew Gould, Chief Executive at NHSX. And just to note, this is a pre-recorded session from a few days ago, but please do post comments or reflections into the chat and we can feed these back in. So now let's hear from Matthew. Hi, um, my name is Laura Rooney. I'm a Director of Strategy at Health Innovation Manchester, working in partnership with the Academic Health Science Network and NHSX to deliver the Innovation Collaborative. Um, and as part of the event today, I'm pleased to welcome Matthew Gould, who's Chief Executive of NHSX, uh, to provide us with some of his reflections um, go over some of the priorities for NHSX over the coming year um, and then we'll have a, a, a short question and answer session with Matthew about some, some key topics. Um, so without further ado, Matthew, um, I'd like to hand over to you to provide us with a, a short overview from your perspective before we get into the questions. Thank you, Laura. And uh, it's, it's very nice to um, have a chance to talk to everyone here. And the most important thing I wanted to say was thank you for the extraordinary work that's been done through the pandemic. The last year, year and a bit, has seen, as well as the health and care system under extraordinary strain, achieving remarkable things. It's also seen a, a, a level of change and transformation that 18 months ago we wouldn't have thought possible. Uh, changes in the way that we use data safely and appropriately, but to improve care of patients and to allow us to find new therapies, to uh, drive change across the system. Changes in the model of care. So uh, at extraordinarily short notice, moving to a model of um, remote consultations of clinicians working from home, uh, keeping the service going, keeping standards up in the service to patients, but in a much more COVID secure way. And that, uh, that was done thanks to the efforts of vast numbers of people um, working incredibly hard in difficult circumstances. And then the changes to the, the clinical pathways themselves which brings us on to what we've been discussing today uh, and the hugely exciting work to move away from a model of care which has basically persisted since the start of the NHS in the 40s to a, a, a world in which uh, particularly people with long-term conditions aren't required constantly to go into formal care settings to see a clinician to uh, have tabs uh, on their uh, progress, to take key measurements. The, a, a model of care at home has really started to take root in the last year. And we've now got little shy of 80,000 patients uh, using uh, digitally powered remote monitoring uh, in uh, over 1,200 care homes. We've got uh, over 90 virtual COVID services around the country. All of them set up, all of this done at a time of acute pressure on the system. And that's been driven by uh, not just the hard work, commitment and skill of our staff, but also an attitude of determination and can do, which has prevailed through the pandemic, where instead of waiting for uh, endless permissions and enormous process, people have just got on with stuff. And it's been fantastic to see, and we couldn't have driven the change that I've described over the last year had we not had that attitude. And my mission and the mission of my team in NHSX is to build on that, to lock in the progress that we've made, to find ways to keep the approach, keep that 
momentum up to build on the progress we've made on data, for example, with the data strategy uh, that's just been published to continue to make progress at the cutting edge. Some of the brilliant stuff, for example, we're doing with the AI lab, propagating proven AI technologies in different care settings around the country. And crucially, to scale up the work that you're all doing on care at home, using digital technology to create and embed this new model of care, which offers so much to patients and to clinicians to create a more effective, efficient service with better patient outcomes that's easier and uh, nicer for everyone involved. Uh, we've seen over the last year the impact that this approach can have. We've seen, heard uh, the, the impact on individuals, on uh, the systems that use them. We've heard enough stories and testimonials to what it's been like for, for both patients and clinicians to, to use the, these remote monitoring pathways that have been created to know how powerful they are. And as over the next year, we really scale them, I wanted just to lodge four thoughts about how we do that. Number one is we can only do so much from the center. We can help with a certain amount of seed funding. We can help with implementation support. We can help bring people together like we're doing today. But ultimately, this is only going to work if it's properly embedded locally, if it's not just uh, a sugar rush from a bit of immediate funding, but it leads to changes in systems and pathways and how things are done. And my biggest hope for all this work is that it's done in a sustainable way so that when the, the central seed funding falls away, the thing continues to go and continues to scale because it's been embedded in the systems and procedures and pathways that you all run locally. And if we don't do that, it's going to be a temporary phenomenon. Secondly, uh, to, um, to uh, misquote uh, Henry Ford, we don't want just to be building a faster horse here. We don't want to take what was done before and simply digitize it. We want to create a different sort of vehicle altogether, which means giving ourselves permission to rethink pathways, to rethink how care is provided rather than just do exactly the same thing, but using digital technology. Because the real power of digital technology, and you see it in many, many other sectors across the economy, comes not just when you digitize what you do, but you rethink what you do, whether it's online banking or retail or any. There are so many examples. The power comes when you change the model itself. And that's what we really ought to be doing with this project. Third thing I wanted to say was we need through this work to be really honest, self-critical and scientific about measuring the impact. Because, I mean, I said earlier, we've seen the impact it has, we've heard enough testimonials, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, we need hard quantitative evidence of the impact on clinical outcomes. And so I've been encouraging the team to make sure that built into the project isn't just the scaling, but evaluation of the most quantitative on uh, indisputable sort, uh, because in a resource constrained environment, we, I firmly believe this is a brilliant investment to make, but we need to build the evidence base. We need to see what works and what doesn't work. And we need to share that evidence with each other so we can the, the, all benefit from this really methodical, scientific, self-critical approach to seeing what works. We don't have the, the luxury of, of magical thinking or optimism in this. We need to be absolutely grounded in measured impact. Um, and then the final thing 
And I guess it's the uh, purpose of today's meeting is we have to share what we're doing. One of the brilliant things that's happened has been to have the 24 project teams up and down the country working closely with the network of AHS AHSNs, building this collaborative that's meeting today. Um, this is incredibly important because if every team that's rolling out remote monitoring in whichever pathway has to create it for itself from scratch, it'll be an enormous amount of wasted effort, unnecessary pain and missed opportunities for improving the care we give patients. So please carry on sharing, share honestly what works and what doesn't work, invest the time not just in um, building the service, but learning from the experience and then sharing that learning. So thank you for being here today because it's a really essential part of the process. Great, thank you for, for that, Matthew. Um, uh, really helpful to get your, your reflections and also um, think about sustainability, um, which um, it has come out loud and clear from some of the, the work we've been doing with the 24 projects, as you say, um, in deploying the remote monitoring technologies. And, um, you know, we've heard through the event today about the significant progress these local teams have made. Um, and, you know, may that continue into, into the new sort of remote monitoring program um, into, the, into this financial year. And, and really, you know, what we hear from speaking with the, the local teams is, um, you know, some of these technologies aren't necessarily new, but responding to the COVID pandemic was the real catalyst for change uh, to get the, the local support behind it. Um, obviously supported by NHSX in the centre, as you said, through, through funding and improvement support and, and, and other factors. So if, if the pandemic was the catalyst for change at scale, um, how do we work with the centre on, and through the regions and, and the new ICSs into the, into the new financial year to, to make this a sustainable change? How do we make remote monitoring um, a sustainable uh, factor in, in service provision in the future? Look, it's a great question. And, and I mean, you're absolutely right. And people who've said it are absolutely right. Some of these technologies are cutting edge. A lot of them aren't at all cutting edge. They're using very well established technologies that simply haven't propagated around the system because we've been wedded to a different way of doing things. The pandemic has been the catalyst for a lot of change. I think what needs to drive it longer term is the knowledge that given the resource pressures on the system, the aging population, the increasing costs of care, the raising expectations for people's care, that we can't just carry on doing what we were doing before. For all sorts of reasons, it's not going to be sustainable. So we have to find new ways of doing it. And remote monitoring and care at home gives us a way of providing care, which is more efficient, more effective, more sustainable. So I don't think actually we've got a choice. Now that doesn't mean that it's going to happen. We still need to drive it. But I think the motivation, the, the compulsion is there in terms of how we get from here to there and make sure it sticks. I think it goes back to what I was saying about making sure this isn't just a bunch of nice projects powered with seed funding that fall away when the funding disappears, which means not just doing the projects, which are brilliant. The, some of the local projects I've seen are absolutely fantastic, but uh, it means changing procedures, changing care pathways, thinking about payment models, thinking about how we use the creation of ICSs to ensure that we don't accidentally incentivize providers to want to stick to the existing model because that's what's funded. We've been stuck in that trap before where doing the right thing can actually be quite costly for bits of a system because the, the funding models reflect the old way of doing things. I think the creation of ICSs, the willingness, enthusiasm of national clinical directors and royal colleges to work with us all to rethink care pathways means there is an opportunity to do things 
substantially differently in a way which sticks. Absolutely. Thank, thanks for that, Matthew. And, and then I guess linked to that um, and, and what you say about, you know, digital isn't about digitisation or technology. Full digital transformation is leading into driving new models of care and changing service models. And, and I think just linked to what you were saying, are there any sort of national level discussions underway with commissioners and providers about how to build remote monitoring and new models of care into, um, into service requirements? Um, uh, more sustainably, so that um, you know we we get we drive that consistency, as you, as you say. Yeah, no, there definitely are, and um, I mean one of the things that I've really learned in my time in the job is the projects we do, the funding we provide, the implementation support. It's all brilliant, but actually. What really sticks is when you get your hands on the uh, the funding models and the rules and the incentives and the the things that really drive the system. And so there's a lot of discussions at the centre, particularly around the models for ICSs. We are present at the creation of this new approach to how the NHS runs. I think the, the, the new ICS-led world is going to be excitingly different. Um, and I think it does present an opportunity at system level to say what we are interested in is outcomes across the system. And we're going to fund for the best outcomes rather than according to the tariff or whatever. So I think there is a massive opportunity. We, uh, we have teams working on precisely this, hardwiring the stuff we're doing that we're discussing today into the plan for ICSs, the target architecture, the funding models, the, the, all the things that drive the system. Uh, but I talked earlier about sharing, I talked earlier about learning from what works, what doesn't work. Um, if anyone on this call has ideas for how we can do this more effectively, has experience of stuff working or even more usefully not working, has advice or concerns about how we can do this, how we can embed it, how we can drive it, please say so. It's really easy to sit at the center and think we understand exactly all the pressures and incentives and uh, what, how, what, how it works at the front line and get it wrong. If we only get it right, I think, when people are willing to say to us, share with us their experience. So the sharing doesn't just need to be front line to front line, it needs to be front line to center as well. Right. And, and um, I think one of the big success stories of, of the last year has been the partnership between health and care services in deploying remote monitoring technologies into care homes. And, and we've seen that in abundance through the, the Innovation Collaborative and, and regional scale projects. Um, could you just give us an insight into what plans there are to sort of deepen the work into, into care homes? Yeah, so... Um... I mean, look, Tara and Breed and Lisa and the team can give you more detail, but um, the brief of NHSX is emphatically social care as well as the NHS. And um, we are working really closely with the social care directorate in the Department of Health and social care to ensure that making use of technologies like the ones that we're discussing today, to keep residents of care homes safe, to prevent admissions, to um, uh, achieve better outcomes for the residents of those care homes are part of the overall strategy for, for social care. And the great thing is, I mean, my colleague, the Director General for Social Care at DHSC, and her team are really enthusiastic about this. But the point is, again, it's not just about deploying a bunch of devices. That's the 10th of, the, of the, the iceberg above the surface. 
what's what what will really drive this is the the 90 percent that's below the surface which means connectivity working with telecoms companies to ensure that care homes have the bandwidth to be able to deploy these devices there's no point deploying these devices if care homes have no connectivity or wi-fi it means skills of staff so that uh, the staff in care homes have that basic uh, digital confidence in dealing with digital technology that this isn't uh, something which flounders on that it means uh, creating and putting in place the infrastructure of shared care records so that data can flow between a patient's record in a care home and the health system safely and appropriately and with permission but that's not going to work if we remain in a position where only a third of care homes are fully digitized um, so there's an awful lot going on but for it to really take for it to have the impact that i think we all want for it to have it's not just about distributing a bunch of blood pressure monitors or whatever it is. It's about building that foundation of shared capacity, skills, systems, confidence that will allow us when we do deploy the devices to know that they will be being deployed in a system that can make best use of them. Right. And, and another area where um, the remote monitoring programme is going to sort of um, deepen and expand this year is mental health. So there's going to be a programme of activity about um, physical health checks for people with severe mental illness. Um, could you tell us a bit, a bit about the thinking behind uh, focusing on that in particular and, and making sure that mental health um, is featured within the, the remote monitoring programme more, more specifically? Yeah, uh, and again, I mean, a really important question because um, actually a mental health has offers enormous opportunity for the use of uh, digital technology to, to, to help patients on, uh, in the system. Um, for example, um, I mean, one of, the, one of the real difficulties we collectively face is a lot of people, particularly young people, on very long waiting lists, which is a really difficult place to be. If you're young and you're suffering from sort of anxiety or depression or whatever it is, to, uh, to, to be placed on a long waiting list and told, well, look, it may be months till somebody can see you is, is I mean, it's, it, it's, it's not the situation or the service we want to be providing. Uh, and digital technology can help. It can help provide services. For example, we've been looking at how it can provide services for people on uh, who, are, who are in that position. It can be another vector for providing therapies. Uh, in fact, one of the interesting things is uh, I've seen some studies which say, I mean, not only are remotely provided uh, therapies in mental health uh, can be as effective as uh, therapies provided in person, but can sometimes be more effective. Um, and there's, there's a sort of interesting insight and learning there. But as well as the uh, opportunity for digital technology, digital therapies to help people uh, with mental illness, there is also this knowledge that the, the outcomes in physical health for people with mental health problems are considerably worse than people without and there's all sorts of reasons for that but what it means is i think we have a obligation but also an opportunity with digital technology to use it to try and address that inequality so that if you are suffering from mental health problems we are not just providing you with an opportunity to use digital technology to uh, address those, but we're also using it, for example, to check that um, your uh, that any uh, cardiac problems are addressed. So, for example, there is a, a project to provide uh, remote cardiac monitors uh, to uh, people in specific mental health pathways. 
and that we will see and we will measure really carefully and effectively what the, the impact is. But I think it's hugely exciting that this really serious point of inequality we can help to tackle. Fantastic. And, and I, just one, one final question, Matthew. Um, you've, you've talked about um, the measurable impact um, and you know, the importance of data in driving this agenda forward. Um, and obviously the use of remote monitoring technologies provides you know, significant opportunities to develop a deeper understanding of, of the needs of our citizens and our patients. Um, and, and drive actionable insights into services, which will in turn, you know, develop new models of care. Um, fr from that perspective, um, what, what's kind of NHSX's plans and expectations in, in those areas, how we use data from um, e the remote monitoring technologies to drive uh, service improvement? So it, it's a huge question. <laughs> and we've just published a, a data strategy which sets out, I mean, a really sort of ambitious plan for how we use data. And the truth is we need to think differently about data. We need to uh, ensure that patient privacy is sacrosanct, that we look after people's data incredibly carefully, but we also use it effectively to improve the care that we can give. And a world in which, um, your GP has some data about you, your oncologist has other data about you, the, the data coming off the devices you've got sits in those devices. Um, if you're in a care home, the data that they hold about, all of these are in separate pots. That situation guarantees that we're not going to be able to get the insight into patients that will allow us to look after them best. So we need to find a way safely to uh, ag be able to aggregate data at the patient level so we can look after individuals and um, say, uh, with suitable safeguards um, uh, at the sort of wider level so we can provide sort of population health services and identify those most at risk and so forth and, and, and provide them with the support that, that, that's needed. So, I mean, fundamentally, this has to be about making sure that uh, data that comes from remote monitoring devices, whether it's those provided by the health service or people's uh, Apple watches or whatever it is, ultimately can come together in a, in, in a, in a safe way so that we can provide better care. And that's, a, that's not a small mission, that's a really huge one that's going to be the task of years. But I hope with the data strategy, and if you, anyone on the call hasn't seen it and read it to cover to cover, definitely recommend it, or at the very least, the executive summary. Um, the data strategy, I hope, will take us forward on that agenda. Fantastic. I mean, thank you for your time, uh, Matthew. We really appreciate you joining us today and um, taking us through your perspectives um, on some key, key items as well. So thank you. Thank you, Laura.